please turn to the Old Testament book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, and we will be looking at verses 1 through 8. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. To find Zechariah, go to the Gospels, go to Matthew, and then start turning back and you will come to Malachi, and then you will come to Zechariah and go to chapter 6. Let's pray again and ask for understanding as we come to Holy Scripture this morning. Father, the Bible, it just literally overwhelms us at times with the truth that it contains about your attributes, about your character, the way your, uh, about your plans and, and purposes in human history. Uh, quite frankly, the Bible, it, it boggles our minds at times. Uh, we thank you for those sections where the truth is, is so clear that we can grasp it and, and understand it without much effort. And then, Father, there are sections of Scripture like the one before us this morning where um, we are stretched to try to, to understand it even when we go and read commentators upon it and do everything within our power to understand. We, we still recognize our, our weakness and our need for strength. And so, Father, we thank you for the promise of the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit. And we come as a preacher this morning, or I come as a preacher crying out to you for assistance and aid as we come to this passage of Scripture. And I come in behalf of this congregation that is gathered, and I pray that you would give us all understanding and, and insight in this powerful section of the Word of God that has so much to teach us about encouragement in difficult times. So, Father, we pray that you would help us now as we come to your Word. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Zechariah 6, beginning to read at verse 1. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country. The white ones go after them, and the dappled ones go toward the south country. When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go, and patrol the earth, and he said, Go, patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Well, this morning we're going to conclude our studies in the eight night visions of Zechariah. And to do this, I want us to review the previous visions quickly before we proceed to this final study. Uh, first of all, in chapter 1, verses 7 through 17, we saw the vision of the man among the myrtle trees. That was the first vision. And then secondly, we saw the four horns and the four craftsmen. That was the second vision in chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Uh, third, we considered the man with a measuring line. That was in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Then we noted Joshua the high priest in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Then fifthly, we saw the golden lampstand and the two olive trees in chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Then we pondered the flying scroll. That was in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Uh, last time when we were in Zechariah, we were startled by the woman who was in the basket. And today we conclude with this vision of four chariots in chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I want to read from Richard Phillips very quickly as he gives a helpful summary 
of these visions. Listen to what Mr. Phillips has to say. From here, we can look back on all eight of these visions and better understand their organization. The first and last visions contain divine horsemen and speak of Jerusalem's relation to the nations. The first tells of a world at peace in which Israel's oppressors rest secure. This last vision shows God disturbing that ungodly peace with his judgment on those nations. And in between these two visions, God deals with the Jewish people and their internal problems. The result of the whole series of visions is a message of encouragement to us, along with an exhortation to build the temple and to spiritually renew the nation. So we conclude today on a high note in these visions. All of these visions, they are gripping, they are startling, they are encouraging, but today's vision is especially impressive. Uh, chariots pulled, and notice several times it says, by strong horses, they go forth to conquer the enemies of God's church. And most commentators believe that the horse-drawn chariots are symbolic of God's heavenly host, or they are symbolic of the angels of God. So the lessons here are fairly straightforward. We as the people of God can rest in this truth that God is going to defend his people. God is going to defend his church. Uh, we are indeed in a battle in this life and we will be in a battle until the Lord returns. But our final victory is assured. We can wage this war with confidence. We can face our foes with courage. There is no place for cowering or cowardice on the part of God's people if his heavenly hosts are with us. The Lord of hosts is fighting for us through his heavenly messengers, and these messengers are likened unto chariots this morning that are pulled by mighty horses. So let's look at the vision itself this morning to get started in verses one through three. Once again, it's the same language that we have seen in several of the other visions. Uh, Zechariah lifts up his, his eyes and he sees a vision. And the vision consists of four chariots. Uh, the first chariot, as you see, is pulled by red horses. The second chariot is pulled by black horses. The third chariot is pulled by white horses. And the fourth chariot is pulled by dappled horses. And notice again the description of the horses in verse 3. All of them were strong. So strength and power is one of the dominant lessons from this vision. Uh, it's not a vision concerning donkeys or ponies. It is a vision concerning mighty stallions, mighty steeds, mighty horses that are pulling the chariots. And notice in verse 1 that these chariots, they emerge from between two bronze mountains. Now the significance of this is somewhat unclear. Some say that they are symbolic, these bronze mountains of the gate to heaven. Others say that they represent the bronze pillars in the temple. Again, the commentator Richard Phillips is very helpful in this regard. Let us see what he has to say about these bronze mountains. He says this, First we consider the meaning of these two bronze mountains. Bronze was a valuable alloy in those days, more valuable then than now, signifying might. Bronze added strength to a weapon or to a shield. Jeremiah was called a bronze wall to symbolize his impregnability against attack. And here we have two mountains which seem to astonish Zechariah because they are whole mountains of bronze. John Calvin understands them as the hidden counsel of God which cannot be broken. Others see them as the spiritual wall of protection God has placed around his people. 
Some commentators see the mountains as Mount Moriah and the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, and others as guardian pillars of God's heavenly temple. Since the mountains in Zechariah's vision serve as a gate for the heavenly chariots, the last suggestion makes the most sense. 1 Kings chapter 7 tells us that Solomon's temple had two bronze pillars astride its doors. The vision seems to expand them exponentially to depict the gate of the Lord's heavenly abode. So this is a tremendous picture of power and strength. The angels are emerging from God's holy dwelling place to do His bidding on earth. And again, one chariot is pulled by red horses, another by black horses, one by white horses, and then the last one is pulled by these beautiful dappled horses. They emerge from God's holy temple. So we have this vision of beauty. Horses are beautiful animals, and it is a vision of might and power. Horses are strong animals. If you've ever worked with horses, uh, you know this. You just can't uh, contain them with human strength. And so this vision, I believe, is a vision of victory. It is a vision of accomplishment. These mighty angels symbolized by the horses and chariots are God's messengers. Now notice, secondly, Zechariah's question regarding the vision and the angel's answer, and you find this in verses 4 through 8. Zechariah's question and the angel's answer. Zechariah asked the angel, the angel of the Lord. You'll remember we have interpreted, interpreted this to be uh, the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, Zechariah asked the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, what are these? And this is not really a surprising question because if we're reading and thinking this morning, we're asking the same question, what does all this mean? So it only makes sense that Zechariah would ask this question He's saying, Lord, I'm really impressed by what I'm seeing, but how does it apply to me, and how does it apply to your people? Well, notice the angel of the Lord's answer to Zechariah. And there's five points that we're going to see here in the answer. Notice, first of all, the travels of the horses and the chariots in verses 5 through 6. The angel of the Lord says, these are going out to the four winds of the heavens. This is another way of saying that the chariots will travel to all the ends of the earth, that there is no place on the earth where the angels will not travel. They will travel north, south, east, and west around the entire earth. Uh, verse 6 further describes this, the black and white horses, they head north, the dappled horses go toward the south. We're not told about the red horses. I think the implication is as they go from east to west, don't pass over this imagery. These chariots are traveling to the four corners of the earth. Notice secondly the devotion of the horses and the chariots in verse 5. They present themselves before the Lord of all the earth. So these horses and chariots are devoted to the plans and the purposes of God. Again, they are symbolic, I believe, of God's messengers, God's angels, God's heavenly hosts, and these heavenly hosts are devoted completely to their God. They do His bidding. They obey His commands. Notice thirdly, the strength of the horses and the chariots in verse 7. They are described once again as strong horses. This harkens back to verse 3, all of them strong. And again, great emphasis is being placed here on this characteristic of the horses or the characteristic of the angels. They possess power for their task. Notice fourthly in verse 7. The purpose of the horses and the chariots, it is to patrol the earth or to examine the earth on their journeys. Notice the emphasis in verse 7. Notice when we read it again. 
It says, when the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Great emphasis is placed upon this fact of patrolling the world on the part of the angels. They are engaged in the work that they are called upon to do. And we saw this same idea back in chapter 1. Some of the same imagery is being used in verses 8 through 11 of chapter 1. So the purpose of the horses and the chariots is to patrol the earth. And then finally, the victory of the horses and chariots in verse 8. Notice the verse again. Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. Now this verse is a little cryptic. It is a little strange, a little bit difficult to interpret. Uh, but one commentator, I believe, has explained it well. He says this, If God judged the north country then all the other lands are securely under his judgment and his protection of his people is complete. His spirit can therefore rest and so can his people. Often Israel's enemies invaded from the north. So the conquering of the north alludes to the victory of the angels, the victory of the horses and chariots, on their mission. So that is the travels of the horses and chariots, the devotion of the horses and chariots, their strength, their purpose, and their final victory. Well, what are some lessons from the vision? Well, the first lesson quite clearly and quite simply is this is that the Lord uses angels in accomplishing His purposes. The horses and chariots are symbolic of God's heavenly host. They are strong, they are powerful, they are sleek, they are fast. They patrol the four corners of the earth and they symbolize God's heavenly host. Again, I remind you in Psalm 91 that we read earlier where it says, for he will command his angels. It's significant that his angels plural and not angel singular. Command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. And again in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 in reference to angels the writer says are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Amen. I'm afraid for years I failed to place an appropriate emphasis on this teaching in scripture. Uh, I believe that I was reacting to an overemphasis that some Christians place upon the teaching and an inappropriate focus. There are some Christians that talk more about angels than they talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as I said in my prayer, we do not worship angels. We worship the triune God. Nevertheless, as Bible-believing Christians, we must acknowledge this clear affirmation that is found in the Word of God concerning the presence and the power of the holy angels of God as He protects His people. I mean, what an encouragement this is to us when we do maintain a proper focus. That we have the Word of God to strengthen us. We have the Spirit of the living God to empower us. But God in His mercy and grace also comes with this teaching pointing us to this unseen world around us of angels and demons and reassures us that the angels are here to strengthen us in our weakness, to strengthen us in our battles, and to provide help for us as the people of God. An encouragement for ministers and an encouragement for serious-minded Christians. I don't think a reformed minister can do better than quote John Calvin. And notice what John Calvin had to say 
about Psalm 91 in this teaching on angels. He says this, When even all these attempts to encourage us have been tried, and God finds that we still linger and hesitate to approach Him, or cast ourselves upon His soul in exclusive protection, He next makes mention of the angels and proffers them as guardians of our safety. As an additional illustration of His indulgent mercy and compassion for our weakness, He represents those whom He has ready for our defense as being a numerous host. He does not assign one solitary angel to each. You know, some people talk about guardian angels. This is what Calvin is countering here. He says he does not assign one solitary angel to each saint, but commissions the whole armies of heaven to keep watch over every individual believer. I wonder if we believe that. It is the individual believer whom the psalmist addresses as we read in the book of Psalms that angels encamp around those that fear Him. We may learn from this that there is no truth in the idea that each saint has his own peculiar guardian angel, and it is of no little consequence to consider that as our enemies are numerous, so also are the friends to whom our defense is entrusted. It were something, no doubt, to know that even one angel was set over us with this commission, but it adds weight to the promise when we are informed that the charge of our safety is committed to a numerous host, as Elisha was enabled by a like consideration to despise the great army of adversaries which was arrayed against him. Remember the story in the book of Kings with Gehazi and Elisha, when Gehazi was so disturbed when they were surrounded by the armies of Syria? And remember what Elisha prayed, Oh Lord, open the eyes of Gehazi so that he can see that those that are for us are more than those that are against us. That's what Calvin is referring to. Nor is this inconsistent with passages of Scripture which seem to speak as if a distinct angel were assigned to each individual. It is evident that God employs His angels in different ways, setting one angel over several whole nations and again, several angels over one man. There is no necessity that we should be nice and scrupulous in inquiring into the exact manner in which they minister together for our safety. It is enough that knowing from the authority of an apostle the fact of their being appointed ministers to us, we should rest satisfied of their being always intent upon their commission. We read elsewhere of their readiness to obey and execute the commands of God and this must go to strengthen our faith since their exertions are made use by God for our defense. God, open our eyes. God, open our eyes to see this. Again, not that we worship angels and not that we bow down to them like we bow down before the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we grasp this teaching of the Word of God and we see it by faith. And we realize that we wrestle not, as Paul says, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And we, we see that we are in spiritual battle. We know that we have spiritual resources to engage the enemy. Amen. Oh, may God open our eyes to see the angels that encamp around us. Secondly, second lesson. The Lord delivers His people from all their difficulties and all their foes. These visions, as Philip said earlier, are messages of encouragement to God's people in their difficulty. Angels have this significant role in our deliverance, but ultimately, Christ is our Savior and Christ is our King. I love the way the Shorter Catechism puts it when it asks the question, how does Christ execute the office of a king? And it says Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. So first of all, Christ delivers us 
personally. He subdues us to himself. Have you been subdued this morning by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ? Has he conquered your stubborn will in the new birth and in the regeneration? He subdues us to himself. He pardons all of our sins. He says to us like he says to the thief on the cross today, you will be with me in paradise. We enjoy a personal salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. He delivers us personally from the wages of sin. Secondly, he delivers us temporarily. And what I mean by that is that as we see from these passages of Scripture already this morning in Psalm 91 in Hebrews, he rules and defends us. He protects us on our earthly pilgrimage. He leads us step by step to the celestial city. I love Psalm 107. If you've never read it, let me encourage you to read Psalm 107. And you see these tremendous stories of how God leads his people through desert wanderings, through imprisonments, through dangers at sea and oppression. A tremendous psalm of deliverance. God is going to get us through this life in spite of all of its difficulties and all of its trials. God, our great king, is right on schedule with us. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. And the apostle Paul in prison, not many days from when, from when his head would be uh, severed from his body, he was able to say this, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear Christian, your days are numbered. And you're going to die on the very day that has been foreordained by your Lord. So just settle that issue. <laughs> And be done with worry and be done with concern over the coronavirus and the state of our nation and all those things. You will exit this world on the day Christ is ordained for you. Just rest in that and be done with fear. It doesn't mean you're, you're not careful. Wear masks where masks are appropriate. Social distance when you can. But my dear friend... Let us cast our fears as far as the east is for west because Christ is our king. He is our deliverer. He has subdued us to himself. And now he rules and defends us through his word, by his spirit, and even through his holy angels. Dear Christian, you have nothing to fear. Your days are numbered by a loving and a heavenly father. And just be done with that whole issue of fear. I know it's a struggle. I struggle with it all the time. But in light of this teaching in the Word of God that these angels surround us, they encamp around God's people, we have nothing to fear. There was an older gentleman in one of my Southern Baptist churches by the name of of John Palmer. I can't mention Mr. Palmer without getting a little misty-eyed. You know, a young minister, you know, you're on a mission to save everybody in your congregation, not realizing it's the Lord that saves them and not you. And so I was visiting with Mr. Palmer one afternoon, and I said, Mr. Palmer, are you saved? He looked at me and he said, saved? I said, yeah, are you saved? And he said, hold on just a second. So he left the room and he went back to a closet, and he came out with a box of pictures. Mr. Palmer trained World War II pilots, and he had all kinds of plane crashes. He had a picture of this, I mean, planes hanging in trees, and planes crashed on the ground, and he had all the pictures of his plane crashes, and then he had all these pictures of his car crashes. He said, the Lord saved me here, saved me here, he saved me here, he saved me here, he saved me here. So, yeah, I'm saved. <laughs> I said, well, Mr. Palmer, I said, I have no doubt that the Lord saved you in those situations, but I'm talking about the bigger salvation, the state of your soul. Are you going to heaven when you, oh, yeah, I've got that settled too. I tell you, that man was one man who knew how to sing through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come 
His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. He delivers his people temporarily, and then he delivers us eternally. He conquers all of his and our enemies. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 states, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And 2 Timothy 1.10 tells us that Christ has abolished death. He has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And he enables us to cry, 1 Corinthians 15, looking death right straight in the face saying, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Our Christ delivers us eternally with a great salvation an eternal salvation from the wrath to come. 2 Peter 3 and verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So with angels supporting us and the promises of deliverance surrounding us and given to us, we labor on for Christ in a sin-darkened world. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, and this is the grand conclusion of that great resurrection chapter on our final deliverance, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There's a lot of labor you can do upon this earth that's going to be in vain one day if it's not done according to God's will and to God's purpose for your life. But when you are laboring for Christ, being strong in Him, being steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, that's a work that's not in vain. And that is work that will be richly rewarded by God's grace when you see Christ return in all of his power and as we're told in 2 Thessalonians 1, with his holy angels. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the way you have encouraged us in these days and these studies in, in Zechariah. These days in our nation are extremely dark and we have faced such challenges in 2020 and yet, Father, we turn to the Word of God and we find that this is nothing strange, nothing new for the people of God on this earth. And it's nothing strange, nothing new for you to come with power through the Scriptures uh, to equip us and to make us the people that you have called us to be. We thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.